Good morning, and welcome to Fridays with Frank, a lecture series sponsored by the Frank Church Institute at Boise State University. My name is Gary Wenske, and I am the executive director of the Frank Church Institute in the School of Public Service. The Frank Church Institute was established to honor the achievements and to carry forward the principles of Senator Frank Church. He delivered the first lecture on War or Peace, the American Role at Boise State University in 1982. Given today's challenges to democracies around the world, conversations like these are even more important. On behalf of the Frank Church Institute Board of Directors, our thanks to Oppenheimer Companies, C. Frederick Cornforth, and Community Development Inc. for underwriting this series on how democracies survive and thrive in the 21st century. Thanks also to Walt and A.K. Minnick and to Loraco and Associates Inc. for sponsoring today's session. And a special thanks to the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress for co-sponsoring this event. Today's speakers will address the topic, Elections Have Consequences. Former Democratic Congresswoman Donna Edwards served five terms as Maryland's first African-American woman in Congress, where she served on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and as a co-chair of the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. Previously, she was the executive director of the National Network to End Domestic Violence and of the Center for a New Democracy. Currently, she is a contributor to MSNBC. Former Republican Congressman Dennis Ross served four terms from Florida's 15th Congressional District following eight years in the Florida House of Representatives. After leaving Congress, he joined Southeastern University as a distinguished professor and became the director of the American Center for Political Leadership. Currently, he serves as a board member of the Association of Former Members of Congress. And joining them this morning is moderator, former Congressman Larry LaRocco, who served two terms from Idaho's first district in Congress. He served on the House Banking and Financial Services and the Interior Committees. Previously, he was managing director of the American Bankers Association. And currently he serves on the board of the Association of Former Members of Congress and the Frank Church Institute. Welcome to all of you. And a reminder, if you have questions for our speakers, please click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time during the session. So let's begin this morning with Larry LaRocco. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this session. I'm very excited to have my colleagues with us, Donna Edwards and uh, Dennis Ross. Uh, Gary has already given their um, bios and their backgrounds, and we're going to get right with it. I do want to say that this is part of the Congress to Campus program uh, at the uh, U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress. Um, I'm very pleased that I uh, co-chair that group with Tim, Tim Petri from Wisconsin. But I don't see um, Everything we do is bipartisan. So we have Don Edwards, who's a Democrat, and uh, Dennis Ross, who's a Republican. Um, today, we have a very, very important uh, and timely uh, topic to discuss with the elections just around the corner. Um, uh, we've got record enthusiasm, record number uh, of uh, contributions and money flowing, and record turnout. So um, there's going to be lots to talk about during this session. Um, Donna and Dennis, I just invite you to make some opening remarks. Um, but where are we going with all of this and uh, what's the downstream effects? Donna, let's start with you. Uh, give us your thoughts and uh, briefly uh, we'll turn to Dennis and then uh, we'll get right into a couple of questions and I'm sure we'll fill the time quite adequately here with this uh, discussion. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Larry. And uh, thank you also to the Frank Church Institute. It's great to be with you. Look, um, I think that we are entering a period of unprecedented voter participation. We can already see that in the early vote numbers, which I think by the time we get up to election day and have an election day vote are really gonna far surpass, already far surpass 2016 
and it may be the best voter turnout ever. That's actually good news for all of us who believe in the Republic, who believe in democracy. I do think it's a challenging environment and um, you know, throw out everything that you've heard about all the polls because I think this election is going to tighten. Um, we have deep divisions in the country and that's gonna play out in the election. And I think that we're gonna to have to be very patient because with the amount of mail-in votes and early votes, it's gonna take a bit to, um, you know, to count this vote. And we're gonna to have to be really patient about, um, about waiting for those returns. In any case, I wanna get right to the questions. Thank you, Donna. Dennis, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I, I concur with my colleague, uh, Donna, and, 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 and Larry, it's good to see you and, and, and Gary as well. And I, I thank the Frank Church Institute also. Uh, these are unprecedented times, not only in voter turnout, but also I think in the, um, in the div divisiveness of where we are and the concern of a peaceful uh, transition and when that will begin. <laughs> so I'm, I'm with Donna. Um, I'd love to get on with the questions and um, look forward to this discussion. It, this is an incredible time right now. Let me just start with a question uh, that maybe we could just discuss. What's different between uh, this election and 2016 or even 2018? 2018, we saw the, the, the House turn in terms of the majority turning to the Democrats. Uh, we had the president out doing rallies and uh, uh, sort of the same thing he's doing now, uh, but the, the House turned in that midterm election. Is, is there anything that's different now uh, that we should be talking about in terms of um, what's going on in the country? Um, uh, so I'll just open it up. Dennis, why don't you uh, I, I would just have to state the obvious, and that's the impact of uh, COVID on this election. You know, in most elections, when you're being attacked, it's usually a, uh, a known en en enemy and, and one which you can you can guard against or at least, you know, uh, attack. Uh, COVID has had the most unusual impact on this election, becoming a campaign issue in and of itself. Uh, but it's also addressed the process by which we are voting, which is probably one of the reasons we have a, a great deal of turnout, also because of the enthusiasm, I think, that's involved. And I think that distinguishes us between any other election in the past. Uh, substantively speaking, uh, from 2016 to, to, to now, uh, what's changed is I think that, that, that uh, Biden does not have near the negatives that uh, Hillary Clinton had, and, and that puts him much closer to being the, 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 the odds-on favorite. Although the Trump team does seem to have a more solidified base, uh, those are the two things I would say are, are a little bit different from uh, uh, 2016, other than the COVID pandemic. Yeah, Donna, I, what's your I think I agree with my friend uh, Dennis, but I want to actually start three and a half years ago because when the president was inaugurated, let's not forget the unprecedented numbers of people, a lot of women showing up on streets all across the country, and of course in Washington, D.C. in that Women's March. That momentum, at least for Democrats, continued on to 2018, which resulted in um, record numbers of, of people co uh, coming out and voting and, um, and turning the tables for Democrats. And I think that that momentum has continued. And, um, and while COVID, has thrown a monkey wrench in all kinds of things that you would expect in an election from, you know, how you go out and talk to voters, door knocking, uh, canvassing, um, uh, uh, rallies on the, you know, on the, on the streets and in communities. It's changed the way that campaigns work. So yeah. many, so much of the campaign now has gone digital. And so that means reaching people in a different kind of way um, in, in unprecedented uh, numbers. And, um, and of course, the virus itself, when you have something that has impacted 9 million people and counting, 230,000 people who are dead, people are thinking about that when they go to the polls. And campaigns are having to adjust um, the way they reach voters because of it. And I, I think that accounts at least for uh, some of the numbers that we're seeing in the early vote. Let's talk a little bit about gender. Um, there's talk of uh, in the polls. I know you said we shouldn't uh, look at the polls, but but what it's saying is that there's a 20 percent to 30 percent gender gap between um, the president and, and Biden. Uh, here in Idaho, there are over 10,000 Idaho women 
that have shown up for um, uh, Biden. It's an amazing group and it sort of blows my mind after 40 years of being active in Idaho politics. And then uh, Dennis, there are more uh, uh, women running for office uh, for the House of Representatives on the GOP side. So maybe we could uh, just discuss gender for a minute here because I think it's, it's a phenomenon in this uh, cycle. Donna, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, look, I think I think that, you know, again, going back to that women's march, it actually resulted in a number of women who had never been engaged in politics anymore to say, you know what, I'm going to put myself out there and run for elective office. And of course, we see how many more uh, were elected. And I think this go around, I think, especially with GOP women, I've always been distressed you know, looking when I was in Congress, looking on the other side of the uh, other side of the House chamber and seeing so few uh, Republican women, I think that uh, that is going to going to grow, and that's a good thing for all of us. And when you look at that gender gap, it's significant. But where is it significant? It's significant among college-educated white women who are flipping the um, the scales and going toward, uh, toward Joe Biden. It's uh, represented in you know, women who are living on their own, who are single or widowed, and those women uh, going with Democrats. And um, you know, I think it's actually good to see. I mean, we are no, we maybe at like 23% in the house of, of women. Well, 23% is not the same thing as 51%. So we've got a long way to go. And I would just simply say that I'm, I'm pleased also as well to see the, 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 the number of women that are getting involved in, po in politics and running for office. I think it's indicative of uh, their uh, belief in, in their, um, uh, their values, their, their value as well as their values, um, and that they see the opportunity to make the difference. Uh, I'm actually encouraged by that, and I think that it, it, uh, it will, will be better off as a, a nation for it. Uh, again, with, with uh, Trump out there, uh, it does not surprise me that he has, uh, you know, a, a faction, if you will, a group, uh, a conglomeration or whatever you want to call it, of, of, of women that do not support him. Um, his personality tends to be a little bit abrasive, as I understand, and uh, um, I, that, does, that does not surprise me at all. But I think what's encouraging by all this is the fact that we're seeing a greater number of women participating in this process. And I think, again, we'll be a lot better off because of that. Great, Dennis. Let, let's talk about money uh, for a second. The, the, the country is awash in money right now. I mean, it, uh, talk about a difference um, in uh, the 2020 cycle. It's just amazing uh, that the money is uh, flowing so uh, uh, abundantly across the country. So is this uh, you know, given our theme of democracies and how we survive, is this good for the process? Is the money coming from the right places or is it too dark or is it uh, uh, spontaneous? Is it uh, just coming from the grassroots? Um, and uh, what does this uh, say to you as, as, as observers of, of the process? Well, it's pretty frightening, I think, if you, um, you know, if you uh, decide that you want to run for office and the amount that it takes to get some of these seats, there are fewer and fewer in the House of Swing Districts um, because of partisan gerrymandering. And, um, you know, I look at a race, for example, a Senate race like uh, South Carolina, Lindsey Graham and um, Jamie Harrison. Jamie Harrison has raised almost $90 million dollars for a Senate seat, $9 million. Um, and so there's a lot of money flowing out there. Now look, to his credit, a lot, a lot of those donors are small donors. Even the Biden campaign, Joe Biden, the rap on Joe Biden was he wasn't gonna be able to raise any money. He is greatly outpacing uh, Donald Trump in terms of fundraising. A lot, I mean, it's true, you know, some of it comes obviously from big donors, but a lot is coming from small donors. And we haven't really fully appreciated the role that the internet has played in opening up the space for small donors to contribute, uh, to develop your list, five, you know, a $5 contribution, uh, which goes a long way. Um, and then we still got to deal with the issue of dark money. I happen to believe there's too much money in politics. I really think that we need to figure out a way to regulate this 
to open up um, the, the role so we know who's giving the money and what they're giving the money for, um, because we don't know what kind of impact that can have on policymaking. Yeah, and to follow up on that, the Citizens United uh, decision uh, really opened up the super PACs and I think um, greater opportunity for dark money. I agree with Donna, there's way too much money in this. And for those of us that have been in the House of Representatives where you're running every two years and the cost of campaigning has gone through the roof, you're spending most of your time uh, raising money. And I think that one of the things we have to do, and Donna hit on this, is the transparency of the source of the funds. Uh, I think that's one of the most significant things we need to do is to make sure that we know where the funds are coming from. Uh, it's tough to balance the right of free speech uh, against, you know, uh, limits, uh, campaign limits on, on, uh, on spending. Uh, but I think that one way we do it is we address where the money's coming from so that at least the voters have an idea of who's trying to influence whom. Uh, and two is we've got to go, look, go back and look at uh, Citizens United. Um, th this dark money and the, and the amounts that can be given to have influence uh, are, are turning elections on their head. Yeah, you know, when Citizens United um, was, the decision was handed, ha handed down. And for those of you who don't know, with Citizens United, it meant that corporations, which had previously been um, prohibited from spending money from a corporate treasury into um, elections and campaigns, Citizens United said, oh no, corporate money in the corporate purse can be used um, in, um, in elections, just not coordinated with uh, with candidates. And this has really just opened it up completely. I introduced the first uh, constitutional amendment to repeal the decision in, in Citizens United. And I think it has to be done to get a handle on, on this money. And look, I'm an advocate of public funding of elections and creating time frames during which one uh, can campaign because it's a little overwhelming. And you know that, Dennis, you're in a swing state for Pete's sake. Um, I don't even know if you can watch television for all the political ads that are going on. You, you know, one way to one way to really do this. It's interesting. When I was in the legislature after the election, uh, you had so many weeks to close out your campaign account. Then you had to start over. When you're in Congress, you never close out your campaign account. You just keep building and building and building it. And, and that might be one way to get people's attention is you have to start fresh every two years. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the other thing that's off the charts is enthusiasm in voting. Uh, I just saw something come across the wire that 9 million people have voted in Texas, which exceeds the amount, uh, the number that was uh, cast in 2016. So uh, the enthusiasm is incredible. Uh, then we have the issues that you've uh, discussed on COVID and uh, uh, reduced uh, uh, places to cast a ballot, uh, uh, various people questioning the validity and the uh, legality of the, the votes that are cast. Is there a national security issue here that we, sh uh, the Congress should be looking at? Or uh, is it right for Congress to look at this? Or is this uh, in the domain of the state legislatures and the secretaries of state and the county clerks? How, how would you approach that? Because there's been so much talk about, um, you know, the, the, validity of the ballots that are being cast uh, today? Well, look, first of all, I think, um, uh, I remember hearing uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray in his testimony in front of Congress, and he really made clear um, that these illusions of voter fraud, and they are illusions, because there is not widespread voter fraud in U.S. elections. It doesn't mean that we don't have to be uh, careful and uh, and guard the security of our elections. But our elections are safe, they're secure, there's high integrity and, and voters should have confidence in that. Um, on the other hand, I think that there are bad actors out there. Uh, there are bad actors who are foreign actors. I think Christopher Wray uh, pointed to this where you know the Russians continue to try to meddle in, um, in our elections by putting out disinformation on the, on the internet and through the web, but they also have been trying to get into these state um, electoral systems. And so states have to be on guard for that. One of the best things that we have as a, as a mitigating factor in bad actors really intruding in the worst way in our elections is the fact that it's completely decentralized. Every county, every, every small jurisdiction control their own elections, they count their own ballots, they report them in. And 
it would take a, a, a virtual miracle for somebody to be able to go into the 1800 um, electoral jurisdictions in Wisconsin and, uh, and change that. And that's true all across the country. Yep, uh, and I agree with Donna there, but I also wanna go back to 20 years ago when uh, we had the Bush v. Gore uh, uh, debacle, if you will. Um, I was in the Florida legislature at that time and it, it, it opened up my eyes to the fragility and, and sanctity of our voting process. And, uh, you know, fraud is something that has to be proven in particularity. I mean, you've got to show a specific intent in fraud. Malfeasance, gross neglect are not basis upon which you can overturn an election. I think we have to be concerned about voter suppression. I think we have to be concerned uh, about the, making sure that every, every ballot is counted. But I also think that, you know, the Constitution gives us under Article 2, Section 2, uh, the, the, the responsibility for each state legislature to determine the method and manner by which they will choose the electors to the Electoral College. And what we saw happen in Florida 20 years ago was that the state Secretary of State, Catherine Harris, could not certify the results. And therefore, we were going into special election, a special session to uh, pass a bill that would nominate or that, that would determine who our 29 elect, back then I think 27 electors were gonna to be to the electoral college, irrespective of the votes of the, of the election. And, and I think that, that sent a shockwave home to Florida and we cleaned up our election process. And fortunately we haven't been the, you know, the, the, the poster child for incompetence in elections in 20 years that happened again this year though, uh, hopefully not. But uh, you know, states have the ultimate obligation. I think it's also very difficult to, to get into each precinct and change votes. But I think also, you know, the United States government has an obligation to be the referee to make sure that voter suppression uh, does not uh, occur and, and everything that can be done to, to eliminate voter suppression. So uh, Dennis and Donna, you watch um, what's going on in the elections on an hourly basis. Um, it, it, you know, you, you are, watching this stuff and, and we're all watching it and we're all consumers of the same information, but we don't analyze it the same way. So um, I would really love to hear just one thought that you have or you could share with our audience on what you see. Uh, in other words, tell us something we don't know or we haven't seen. What, what do you think is sort of hidden in the numbers, hidden in the enthusiasm, hidden in the money, hidden in the momentum? you know, hidden in the rallies, hidden in the door-to-door -door stuff that uh, the Trump administration is doing versus the, the COVID virtual type of campaign. Is, is there anything that you see out there that, uh, you know, as you analyze it, that, that maybe uh, uh, the normal reader of uh, the Washington mm -hmm. Post or, uh, you know, anything else that we're all consuming don't see? Don, I'll let you take the fat, that one right there. Well, you know, look, I write for the Washington Post, so I pay a lot of attention on the uh, uh, opinion page and in the news about what's going on. Um, I, I do think that one thing to take a look at and that many of us should be looking at are um, people who either didn't show up to vote in 2016 or who never voted at all. These low propensity voters and the numbers of them who are turning out. Uh, for example, in Texas, it's actually this cohort of voters that may turn the tide in Texas uh, from red to blue. Look, I think it's going to be tough uh, to do that, but I'm starting to look at that cohort of voters in these um, in these uh, swing states, and you know, states are out there that are reach states for uh, for Biden or hold states for uh, for Trump and what that cohort is doing because we didn't hear from them in 2016. And a lot of them, we didn't hear from them in 2012 and 2008 either, but they're showing up at the polls now. Yeah, you know, it's hard to, to, to really assess where we are other than to, from my opinion to say that without Pennsylvania and Arizona, Trump just doesn't win this race. I mean, that, and, that's, and that's taking both Texas, Florida and Ohio. Uh, and, and that's still a, a tough measure right now. Um, but then again, the enthusiasm has been unparalleled and you just wonder if it's equal or if it's one-sided. Uh, so if, if I had to say, I, I, it, it, I think it's going to be a very close race and it will not be decided the third or maybe not even the fourth or thereafter anytime soon. 
I think that's an interesting observation that, and, and I think, uh, Donna, you may have said it earlier that we just have to be patient uh, with this election because of the different modes of voting. We have absentee, we have early voting, and then we have people going to the polls. Um, as I observe it, people have uh, said that the, the Republicans want to vote on um, on election day because they know those will be counted first and and uh, maybe the mail-in ballots uh, and the absentee ballots will be counted later. I don't know if that's a strategy. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if you could, you know, herd all these caps, but I mean, people are just showing up and, and uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. And um, um, so um, tell, tell us about the, the Trump administration, Dennis, and, and the first 100 days, uh, and then maybe Donna, you could tell us about the Biden administration in the first 100 days, uh, things that you expect. Um, uh, the, the title of our session is uh, Elections Have Consequences. So what are the consequences? And you could put in any scenario you want, and that is whether the uh, Democrats win the majority in the Senate or, uh, you know, they pick up... Uh, uh, the Democrats pick up seats or lose seats in the House. Any way you want to go with that, Dennis? And any thoughts? I, I, yeah, I've, I've got uh, several thoughts on this. I, I think that 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 the Democrats will most likely continue to control the House. Uh, it's just going to be a very tough uh, uphill battle for the for the Republicans. Um, and the Senate's going to be very close. But even if the Senate stays the way it is, I think this president in his first hundred days is going to be focused more on executive orders and regulatory rulemaking. I think that's where he's going to have his greatest impact, in addition to probably appointing more judges. Uh, I, I think his relationship with a, uh, a democratically controlled House is going to be more strained than ever. Uh, if the Senate is democratically controlled, I, I think it's going to be, you know, some some terrible gridlock, although I think it would raise the opportunity to get some things done because, uh, well, I, I think there's an opportunity. I mean, we, we still have to address our debt at some point. Um, but also internationally, I think this president will continue to focus on the Middle East and what he's been able to do there with Bahrain and UAE and now recently Sudan. Sudan. Uh, but I would think those would be the areas. And, and, and of course, his control or his, his control, his influence on the um, uh, Federal Reserve will continue. And I think it will be his goal to keep the uh, the interest rates as low as possible and to keep capital available for businesses to, um, to, to, to access and invest. Thank you. Donna, thoughts on a Biden administration out of the gate? Sure. Well, um, good for Dennis at trying to guess what the, um, you know, what the agenda <laughs> is going to be for a second term, because I think when asked that question, I think it was during the debates, the president really did not have a, a response as to what he'd do in a second term or in one of his, his interviews, he couldn't answer that. As to a Biden administration, I think it's been very clear. Joe Biden has kind of laid that out. He said that first of all, he's got to you know, put in a real plan around COVID and responding to this by getting PPE out, by making sure that we pass a COVID relief bill for, uh, for particularly for our small businesses, uh, to get our schools situated so that people can go back to schools, all of that. And, um, and then he's laid on an agenda, uh, aggressive agenda around um, infrastructure investments, around climate change, um, and, and dealing with um, unifying the country and uniting the country, which I think is so important at this time. And so, um, it, you know, and that's a lot to do. And I think any president who comes in knows that that first 100 days is about the most important 100 days because it defines not only the rest of the year, but it's what, it's the basis on which you go in to those next midterm elections. And so, um, I look at Biden as being very clear uh, about what his policy agenda is. And when I think back to when I came into Congress, I actually came in in uh, a special election in 2008. But my first election was really that 2008 election. Barack Obama was elected. We had a looming uh, financial crisis. The Bush administration was working on uh, relief at the end of the uh, at the end of 2008 that Obama would have to implement 
Um, and I look at this environment right now for Joe Biden in those same ways because of the turmoil that has been brought by uh, COVID and the impact on our economy. And, you know, that's something that is go he's going to have to deal with, um, not in the first hundred days, but really in the first days of his administration, if he wants to be a success. One thing uh, that I see maybe in a, a difference in approach here is that um, um, in a Trump administration, uh, Dennis, you mentioned executive orders, which means uh, not necessarily a, the relationship with the Congress and getting things done. And uh, Donna, you're mentioning uh, that there would probably be uh, more collaboration between the, uh, the both branches of government. Um, I think there's some frustration maybe out in the heartland of America with uh, uh, the dysfunction of, of Washington, D.C., generally defined. And um, um, do you see uh, either outcome, Trump or Biden, uh, sort of bridging that gap? And, and uh, um, how do you view things? Uh, we've all served there. Um, and uh, uh, we all think back to greater days, but uh, 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 the approval rating of uh, Congress is still pretty low. Um, which way, how do, you, how do you put all this together? Well, you know, I, I actually um, worked with uh, Joe Biden when he was a Senator back in the nineties. And um, he was very much a person who worked across the aisle with um, his Republican colleagues. I think he understands governing and he understands the Senate in that way. And I think that that has been a disadvantage for, uh, for Donald Trump. He hasn't really had an appreciation of the legislature um, and, and valued it. And as a result, has had very contentious relationships. He's also brought on people in his administration who really didn't get, um, get Congress. And so I think a, under a Biden administration, I think that that would change whether or not you flip the Senate and look, um, I didn't answer this before, but I think that Democrats are gonna get a trifecta. Um, but that also brings a lot of responsibility. If you've got the House and the Senate and the White House, there's not gonna be any excuse for failure. Um, and so that's a lot, of, a, a lot of pressure. But I think Joe Biden kind of brings this appreciation of the institutions that will actually help him in the governing. You know, I would love, I would love to see uh, a president that that realizes that that the Congress is is a um, uh, equal partner in the administration of, of, of affairs for this nation, and and I think that, you know, members of Congress have to go home with something, and so does the president, and and um, you know, I remain optimistic that, irrespective of who may win, that we will see Congress and this White House uh, work towards. Uh, resolution of issues, and, and I might just be a purist and, and 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 overly optimistic, but ultimately that's the way we've got to get things done. Because I, as I mentioned before, you know, you've got a president who may resort to doing regulatory rules and, and executive orders, but that's not a way to run a country. You've got to engage the Congress. Even Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan knew that, uh, and and they were able to get things done. George um, Bush knew it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we, but we've got to. I don't know. Uh, I, I would like to see that happen. And, and my eight years, I didn't see it happen as I thought it should happen under two different presidents. And so we'll see what happens. Um, we, we've had a question from our audience on uh, voter suppression generally. I mean, the requirements for various things, photo IDs and uh, uh, the affidavits and so forth. Uh, um, do you have any views on this, on how uh, this could be approached uh, so that we could get, uh, uh, you know, continue with the enthusiasm that we have and give people access to the ballot box? Uh, or is there even a problem? Or uh, what do you see in, uh, you know, from where you sit? Well, there's a problem. I mean, I think that there are multiple problems. Um, you know, voter suppression is something that uh, you know, you can look at it in a lot of different ways. So for example, um, right now there are something like 300 lawsuits going on all around the country, challenging voters, challenging election procedures, challenging the process. 
that has a way of suppressing voters as well. Um, there are, um, you know, there are efforts out there after the voting rights, the section five um, of the Voting Rights Act was essentially deep six by the United States Supreme Court in, um, in Shelby v. Holder, that there has been a real challenge in these, in many states that were states that required the Department of Justice uh, in a, in a, in pre-clearing, that is sort of looking at the ways in which you were making sure to validate voters of color, that um, once that happened, then you saw the passage in so many states of laws that were frankly designed to suppress the votes of African-Americans, Latinos um, it, it, throughout the country. And so that tells me that there's a need um, to fix and reinstate the Voting Rights, Rights Act. So, um, but voters, are, it, apparently voters are saying, you can try to suppress my vote, but I'm gonna show up to vote anyway. Um, and so I, I think there's some of the enthusiasm, frankly, has been generated by these efforts, you know, coming around to say mail-in ballots are invalid, that, um, you know, that uh, you, you can't uh, vote and have your mail ballot come in before election day. And voters are rejecting that by showing up to vote. Yeah, I, I think voter suppression is a, is a serious issue and, and um, more so than voter fraud, because again, voter fraud has to be uh, proven with, with specific intent, but voter suppression can be done in many ways um, and, and, and in many ways, silent ways. Uh, I think the enthusiasm of the voters is, is good. Florida addressed this, as many other states have, by the use of a provisional ballot. So let's say you go to vote and you don't have your ID with you, your picture ID. You fill out a provisional ballot anyway. Uh, let's say you go to the wrong precinct. You fill out a provisional ballot anyway. Let's say you mailed in your ballot and you don't remember, but you, you go and fill out a provisional ballot anyway. The audit trails that are hopefully in place which will take some time. That's why you, your decision will probably not be on the date of a, the night of election, uh, but it will be able to verify whether there has been, you know, it, it, not so much voter suppression, but but um, uh, dupli uh, uh, duplicative voting, um, um, inappropriate voting. Uh, but I think, you know, Donna hits on something. Voter suppression has been and continues to be an issue that we have to face as a nation. And while I would also look to the Voting Rights Acts, I think each state also has to make sure that the access is available for everybody to their, uh, their, their, their precincts to vote. Well, look, our elections are not um, perfect. I mean, but when you have over 100 million people voting, to the extent that you have then a problem, um, you know, whether it's an indication of fraud or whatever, that, that is such a minuscule percentage um, and so I don't think that we should use that to then call into question all of our elections or the integrity of our elections, but we need to continue to do things, I think that encourage people to vote. I'm, I'm actually very troubled, frankly, um, Dennis, that so much of the efforts to discourage people to vote in this election is really coming from Republicans at you know a local and a state level. And I think it's really unfortunate because we want more people voting and we need to figure out, you know, ways to do things like in my view, universal voter, voter registration, ways to get more people uh, engaged in the process. Yeah, you know, I, I'm not aware of, of, of what you speak of about the Republicans, but, and I'm really not, um, but, but I, I am encouraged and I, as I advocate for many times, an increased number of people voting and I'm hopeful we'll see that. Yeah, something's going on out there. I mean, these numbers that are coming in are just astounding. Um, I had a thought of, uh, that maybe you could address um, for our audience, um, uh, you know, some insights that you have on uh, new leadership in, in the House, on, in both the conference and the caucus, not necessarily assuming that, uh, uh, you know, McCarthy is going to be overthrown or Pelosi is going to be thrown out, but um, are there names and colleagues and uh, people that uh, we should be watching for uh, leadership uh, uh, that could, uh, you know, change the tone or uh, ascend to those positions, assuming that uh, uh, the current leadership won't be there forever. I think it's such an important question and consideration. Um, 
you know, when you look at prospectively, whether it's a Trump administration, Trump presidency or Biden presidency, and say Mitch McConnell, you know, wins his reelection, and then you got, you know, Chuck Schumer on the other side, that's a lot of really old people. And if Biden wins, it's still a lot of really old people. Now, look, as I've aged, I have less against uh, older people um, because there's a lot of wisdom that can come <laughs> that too and experience. And so we should not denigrate that, but at the same time, begin to look at that next generation of leaders. And on the House side among Democrats, I see people like Hakeem Jeffries and uh, from New York, Catherine Clark, who's uh, from Massachusetts. Um, there are a number, David Cicilline from, uh, from uh, Rhode Island. There are a number of emerging new leaders in the House. And I, although Pelosi has is, is indicated that she's gonna run for speaker again, there is a new rule put in place. And so that means I think that this will be the last time that she would be able to run um, for speaker, but I think she wants it to be, uh, be the last time and to try to grow that leadership. And I remember when people were trying to, you know, basically sort of, there was a move to try to throw her out um, in, in 2018 that that failed and thank goodness it did, or 2016, and thank goodness it did because I think she has been the best, strongest leader that Democrats could possibly have had um, in pushing back on some of the, uh, the worst instincts of, um, of this administration. So I don't know what you see on the uh, Republican side. McCarthy's not as old, so we're gonna give him uh, no, yeah. I, I agree with you. He's not as old, but he suffers from what I suffer from, and he's a gray-haired white guy. Uh, right. we, have, we, have, we have probably too many of those in the Republican Party uh, right now. And, and Kevin's a dear friend. So is Steve Scalise. In fact, I, I saw Steve this last week. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity uh, for others. I think Lynn Cheney is going to make a mark, uh, and I think she's going to be welcomed in that role. And I think it would be good for uh, balancing some diversity uh, in, in our party, but I don't see any major changes. I think that in the Senate, if they lose the Senate, that you will probably see Mitch McConnell not be the leader of the minority. Um, I think, think that there will be a change. Who do you think is next up? I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I know Ben Sass is, 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 is become uh, quite okay. vocal. Um, that's a good one. I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, yeah. I, and even on the even on the Democratic side, I mean, I think Chuck Schumer, obviously, he's you know they uh, flip the Senate, he's going to be the majority, okay. leader, but he's getting up there too. And I I think you do see um, waiting in the wings some new um, leadership among the the many Democratic women who are now serving um, serving yeah. in the Senate. I mean, Chris uh, 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 Kirsten Gillibrand ran for uh, for president. She's emerging. Yeah. Amy Klobuchar emerging as a, as a leader. So there's a lot to choose from, I think, on the Democratic side. I'm looking forward to that, that's for sure. I agree. Yeah, I, as I looked at the uh, uh, elections in 2018, and uh, there were so many talented people that came in. Of course, AOC was sort of uh, sucking the oxygen out of, uh, you know, every everything, you know. Uh, uh, she was very high profile and, um, and remains so. But there were some outstanding members that uh, uh, Alyssa Slotkin and, and people with unbelievable national security backgrounds on the Democratic side and, and, um, um, and new leaders coming in on the Republican side as well. So um, um, when I speak to students, I talk to them about the average term of uh, you know, members of Congress. It's only about eight years now, and right. people think that they're all there forever, and they're not all there forever, right? I mean- um, no. Yeah, there's a lot of turnover. I mean, you can really see it. And that's why, like, even when I was in Congress in my fifth term, and I decided to run for the United States Senate when Barbara Mikulski uh, retired, and I knew I'd be giving up my seat. But when I looked at it, I thought, am I going to be here for 10 more years anyway? And the answer to that was probably no. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I, I was not. I, 10 years was all I wanted to do. And after eight, I thought, I think eight's good. Yeah. Well, I, all I can tell you is that you ought to be a Democrat in Idaho. Boy, you got a target on your back all the time, I'll tell you. So, 
So I, you know, I was able to eat two terms out of it out here, and that uh, that's well, about all they give you. For Republicans you know? in Maryland, right? <laughs> yeah. A little bit different, yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, that a little bit because uh, uh, what I think we're talking about is uh, gerrymandering, or uh, that's a negative term, but it's going to be redistricting. And uh, uh, any thoughts on redistricting after? Um, you know, the, the, the races of 2020, any uh, um, legislatures that could totally flip, um, uh, you know, one way or the other. Uh, a lot of people have not focused on the, the fact that the country is going to redistrict itself in 2022. Well, we've also had a very complicated census um, season because of COVID. Ordinarily, you would have lots of hired enumerators going door to door, um, trying to identify, you know, uh, uh, people and making sure that they, you know, sent in their census forms. And that's been uh, really complicated. And that, of course, is the basis on which we then um, are able to draw the lines um, that the state legislatures can draw the lines. I have to say, I was in the minority in my delegation among Democrats in Maryland when I did not support the way the lines were drawn, even though it resulted in seven Democratic seats and one, uh, one Republican. I find um, the kind of partisan political drawing of lines offensive to voters. And I think that we would do well if we want, if we're interested in governance in trying to figure out a better way to do it. I really believe in using these sort of independent um, commissions um, that are tasked with, with drawing the lines that take into consideration neighbors. When my district was drawn, I used to describe it as earmuffs because it had one big blob on one side that was the county I live in. It had um, a, a little narrow sliver going across the top, which was a highway connecting the other big blob um, in another county. And I thought these counties didn't have a lot in common, that um, there were you know, distinctions that were important to the people who lived there. And yet that was not part of the consideration when we drew the lines. Yeah, I think you're right, uh, Larry, that 2022, people are gonna wake up and see that California has lost a member of Congress because they're losing a congressional district for the first time. New York's going to lose one. Florida anticipates picking up two. But, you know, it's interesting. The party in control, of course, does control, but they don't necessarily take care of their party because uh, a couple of years ago when I was in Congress and uh, they were redraw, they had to redraw the lines uh, in the middle, I think, 2015 because of a court decision. And there were several Republican legislators that decided they wanted to go to Congress. And so they looked at my district and decided to start carving it up and put my district across, literally across the street from where I lived. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get involved with this. Fortunately, it all worked out. Um, and, but uh, we're gonna, if we're gonna pick up two new seats, you're gonna see a lot of self-interest over partisan interest uh, in, these, in these legislators, especially in Florida where you have eight years as a term limit um, and they wanna know what they're gonna do after that. They, most of them wanna carve themselves a congressional district. So it's gonna be it's a amazing. change in the maps, and I could be a change in the representation, uh, partisan-wise, in twenty twenty-two. Let's let's talk a, a little bit about oversight. Um, uh, do you think that Congress, uh, both the House and the Senate, is doing a good job? I mean, uh, uh, let's assume um, Don is right. Let's say it's a trifecta. So um, uh, then, I mean, are the Democrats going to? Uh, be so um, adamant about oversight at that point uh, as they uh, are with uh, uh, Trump as president. And, and maybe we could discuss this from a civic standpoint or the civics lesson on whether that's the proper role, what they should be doing. And, and uh, this is really important because uh, we have two branches of government here and uh, oversight is really, really key. Well, I think it's out of balance right now. Um, when we talk about having you know, sort of three branches of government and that they're equally uh, positioned, I think it's really out of balance. And I've long thought that Congress needs to do a lot more to claw back some of the um, power that's been ceded to the executive. Um, and 
you know, and I do think that Democrats, if Democrats win the House, it's going to be on them to do the kind of oversight that is aggressive and important. I remember when we had control, uh, Democrats had control of the House, Obama was president, we also had the Senate, and I was on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, and we had implemented the stimulus package with all that money going out to the states to rebuild, you know, roads and bridges. I can remember Ray LaHood, our former, co uh, former colleague, as Secretary of Transportation, sitting in, a, uh, in front of our committee. And I remember grilling him very aggressively about where those resources were going, whether those projects were, were getting done, how many jobs were being uh, created. So there is a role for aggressive oversight in, in, and proper oversight, even when you have all branches of government. Larry, this is where we hit upon at the beginning of the, the program when you said that, uh, you know, elections have consequences uh, and oversight is one of those consequences, I think. I served on the House Oversight Committee uh, in, in uh, my freshman term when, when Obama was president and my last term when uh, uh, I served on that committee when, when Trump was president. A big difference uh, when you're setting the agenda and, and you have to self-investigate, if you will. Uh, and and uh, I... I, I I would like to see aggressive oversight. I think that's an absolute right of Congress, irrespective of who's in the White House. Uh, but there is a tendency when the other party is in the White House and the other party's in control and the, the over oversight, it's a lot more aggressive. I think the American people have the, the, the obligation to, 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 to know what's going on. Uh, at least they have the right and the Congress has the obligation. Um, but I think that it does, uh, tamper down when, when both parties, when, when the same party's in control of Congress and the White House. I, I, I think these are really good points because um, um, at the Frank Church Institute, we've discussed uh, democracy and democracies. And, and uh, we're convinced that not all democracies fail because there's a revolution or a rebellion or there's uh, uh, armed forces in the streets or the military takes over, that uh, democracies can erode because of uh, uh, the norms and the guidelines and the sideboards that um, uh, we normally accept it just erode. And so if you don't have oversight, then uh, I don't know where that leads. It leads to too much power uh, placed in one one place. And uh, if, if Donna is right and there's a trifecta, I think there should be a lot of oversight. And uh, uh, uh. Well, I mean, I, Congress has to begin to exercise its prerogatives as the Article I branch of government. I feel very, very strongly about this. I was opposed, for example, for removing um, uh, earmarks, congressionally directed projects, because I thought it meant that Congress, instead of exercising its you know, full powers of appropriating and deciding how we spend money, gave up its authority to the executive branch. And Dennis was better able, and Larry, you were better able, and I was better able to say what projects made sense in my congressional district than having, and I live close to Washington, but having somebody sit in an agency and make that determination um, for, uh, for each member of Congress. So I think there are a lot of ways in which Congress really has to claw back its Article I responsibilities. I agree. I agree. So um, we've been at it for almost an hour. Uh, I'm going to see if Dennis, uh, if uh, uh, Gary Wensky is going to pop in and say we have more time or not. Um, uh, let's just see if Gary's uh, watching us. Uh, um, but as, uh, let's assume, Gary, we've got a few more minutes, and maybe um, maybe what we could do is uh, just open the mic for uh, Dennis and and. Uh, uh, Donna, to make some concluding remarks, or do we have some questions that you want to read? Uh, uh. I think you've covered uh, most of the questions. Uh, one question that uh, came up is whether the House of Representatives uh, should be substantially enlarged after the census and make it and the Electoral College more representative. I think that uh, I think if we've got problems now with 435, I think any more than that uh, is going to make it compounded even worse. Um, and, and, and I'm a purist. I, I like the Electoral College the way it is. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I think that these 
um, important structural questions or questions that we really need to, um, to study and, uh, and then to figure out what kinds of structural changes make sense. I actually am a fan of the Electoral College is, in my view, a remnant of our slaveholding days. And I think it's time for it to go. Um, uh, on the other hand, I do think that the size of our congressional districts, while they're large, they're still manageable. And they still can result, if we draw the lines properly, in members of Congress being able to fully represent the interests of their districts in addition to the, uh, to the national um, interest. I've seen a number of questions in the, you know, in the chat having to do with you know, a peaceful transition of power. I think that we're gonna have one. Um, and I think we've done, we've had transitions of power by my calculation for 223 years. Um, I think that we can, and through sometimes very difficult times, including a Supreme Court, I think we're gonna get, uh, get through that. And lastly, I think that, you know, um, this next generation of, um, of millennials and Gen Zers and uh, this, you know, sort of youth um, group, there are young people now, um, they, are, they are quickly the majority of the country. And some of us are gonna have to take a step back and I put myself in that. I may think I'm 25, but I'm not. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I think we're gonna have to stick, take a step back and allow these new leaders to emerge. I agree. Well, great. And any, uh, let me invite any closing thoughts uh, for our audience uh, here. Uh, we'll be streaming this. The former members of Congress will have access to our program as well, Dennis and Donna. So you're really speaking to the country. But uh, I want to remind uh, our viewers and audience that uh, this was a bipartisan program. Uh, it was done without rancor or uh, it was done in a civil basis and uh, in a civil way. Uh, that's the way uh, the Congress to Campus program has always existed. And uh, I just appreciate uh, both of you coming on our program today and uh, being part of our lecture series to talk about this important subject and uh, doing it. Uh, there was disagreement, but it was uh, uh, done um, in a very civil way. And I really appreciate that. So any closing thoughts? My closing thought is to agree with you, Larry, on that. And that's one of the things that I have a passion for. Uh, I, I didn't get to know Donna as well when I was in Congress, but have since I've been out of Congress. And I think we both have a passion for making sure that despite the fact that we cancel each other's votes out all the time and we have disagreements on different issues, we still have an opportunity to build a relationship, be friends, and know that the greater good is, a, is, is what's best for our country. Well, look, I just wrote in the chat that Dennis and I are buds. Um, and so it's been great to do this program with you, uh, with you Dennis. And- Likewise. Larry, thank you, uh, and Gary, thank you. Larry and Gary, thank you very much uh, too for the opportunity. And I would just say this, um, it's your generation. You know, take charge, own it. Um, get out there and make sure that you vote and make sure your voice is heard. And then if you can, think about public service. Um, I think Dennis and I would both agree, and Larry as well, um, serving in Congress was an honor and it's a great gig. Um, and you have a chance to do some uh, do some good wherever you serve at whatever level you serve and that you're contributing to your community. And, you know, we're going to rock and roll with this election, but we're going to get through it. We are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, all three of us were very fortunate and privileged to be uh, uh, three of about 11,000 Americans that have served in the Congress of the United States. And uh, um, we value our experience and uh, particularly our relationships with each other. So thank you so much. Uh, I'll turn it back to Gary and uh, I hope to see you all in person and stay healthy and uh, uh, we will get through this. Gary. Thank you. Thank you. And our thanks to Representative Donna Edwards, Dennis Ross and Larry LaRocco for their very timely presentation. Note the next Fridays with Frank will be held Friday, November 12th with the Executive Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. For student viewers, please join the Boise State All Campus Challenge by going to idahovotes.gov. The stakes are too high for you not to vote. Thank you and good day.